Some while ago I made a video about Stirling engines and it was surprisingly successful. And it might be a good idea if you uh, make sure that you've seen that video, uh, because in that I explain how Stirling engines actually work. Something I don't want to uh, repeat in this, the follow-up video on Stirling engines, which has been sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. So be warned, there's an advert coming. Uh, now, in my earlier video I made a number of predictions and statements, and I've been following up on those, and one of the things I talked about was how this the Stirling engine might be uh, part of the future of energy production worldwide, and it seems that already baby steps are being taken in that direction. My attention has been drawn, for instance, to the work of Swedish Stirling, uh, a company which was uh, part of the development uh, team that came up with the Stirling engines that ingeniously powered Swedish. Uh, naval submarines uh, through the Baltic, and in one uh, extremely successful military exercise they showed that they could have, I mean they didn't actually, it was an exercise, but they got themselves into a position to sink a very large amount of uh, American naval shipping, and uh, the American Navy was apparently quite alarmed by this and demanded uh, that they uh, be told all about this technology that had just, in theory at least, defeated them. And much to the annoyance of a lot of Swedes, and I do sympathise because if you've just developed a bit of ingenious military technology, perhaps you, you do want to keep it to yourself, that's quite understandable, uh, this technology was then uh, shared with the demanding Americans. Um, but anyway, uh, the same company, Swedish Sterling, uh, has now branched out into more um, mainstream uses of the Sterling engine in power production. Um, at the moment, what they've come up with is something that fits into one container, so you can ship it around uh, in a container ship, stick it onto one lorry and get it into position fairly easily. Uh, and in that container there are 14 large Stirling engines which run off the heat produced by waste gases from some other industry. So if you've got some big, I don't know, oil refinery or something like that that has a lot of uh, waste gases that were once just burned off to no effect, uh, that, those can be used to run these Stirling engines. And they reckon that one of these units should last, if properly maintained, about 25 years and pay for itself in about five years. Five years might seem like quite a long time, and it is, I suppose, a fair while to get your money back. But on the other hand, nuclear power stations, which are stupendously efficient when they are running at full tilt, um, they do cost an awful lot of money to build in the first place, and an awful lot of money to dismantle safely afterwards, which is something they call decommissioning. And so to pay for themselves overall, they do actually have to be run for really quite a considerable time to uh, stand any decent chance of pulling that feat off. So perhaps, viewed in that context, five years really isn't so bad. There's another Swedish company which has decided to call itself Azelio for a reason presumably, and it is also trying to uh, enhance um, small-ish scale uh, energy production in far-off places, and they are particularly trying to increase the efficiency of solar power. Now there's a big, there are quite a few problems with solar power. Um, one, for instance, is illustrated by uh, this graph here. Um, now you'll see that the hours of the day are illustrated uh, along the bottom, going up to 24 there, and then when dawn breaks and the sun starts shining, you start producing electricity and then it peaks and my goodness what a peak and then it tails off again and that's a lot. So uh, solar power is it's pretty impressive in the middle of the day, but the rest of the time you're not getting, well, any. Um, and here, unfortunately, is the demand curve. This is what they say is a typical demand curve. I have to say I suspect that that's a typical demand cur curve for Sweden because you'll notice there's quite a lot of energy demand in the middle of the night. And in the cold winter nights of Sweden, yes, you do need uh, quite a lot of heating to stop everything from freezing. But I suspect that in the heat of Abu Dhabi or Morocco, where they're also trialling this technology, uh, people are frankly just glad of the relief of a bit of cool during the night. Um, but anyway, the point is still the same. If you want in Abu Dhabi to play computer games at 10 o'clock at night, uh, you want some electricity. And solar power isn't going to help you there. Not on its own, not without some means of storing that solar power. So what they've come up with is a system that uh, uses Stirling engines. Uh, but before we get to the Stirling engine, let's talk about the way they store the heat. They do this with massive lumps of aluminium, which they then melt. That might not seem the most obvious way to store energy, but um, uh, listen up. You see, there's something called the uh, latent heat of fusion. Um, now, when you heat up a solid, eventually it gets so hot that it starts to melt and it, it changes state. Uh, on the Azalea website they talk about phase shift, which is a, 
a term which I associate with waveforms and, and not, nothing to do with the latent heat of uh, fusion. But when I was at school, we would have called this a change of state. So the states being solid, liquid, and gas. And when you get to the borderline, uh, a, 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 where one thing changes into another, you get a change of state. And the borderline between uh, solid and liquid uh, involves the latent heat of fusion. So you've got this big lump of aluminium, and why do they use aluminium? Well, it's an awful lot cheaper than gold. Uh, it melts at a fairly convenient temperature. It melts at about 660 degrees centigrade, which is not all that hot. Uh, whereas you have to get iron all the way up to 1538 degrees centigrade before it'll uh, oblige you by melting. Um, and even when you get it to that high temperature, it has a lower um, uh, latent heat of fusion. Uh, you get about 270,000 uh, joules per kilogram. Uh, out of iron, whereas you'll get 390,000 out of aluminium. So aluminium is just better for this, okay? So that's why they use aluminium. So you've got this big solid lump of aluminium and you start using electrical uh, energy uh, that is uh, generated by uh, solar power during the day to melt it. And so it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. You put your hand on it, it's a bit cold at first, and then, oh, no, no, I can feel a bit warm now. And then, oh, ha, it's really quite hot now. And it, it heats up and heats up and heats up until it's almost, but not quite, at melting temperature and then to go that little bit extra takes a huge amount more energy. Uh, the energy is not uh, going into heating it up, it's going into changing its state and for aluminium it takes quite a lot of energy to change from a solid into a liquid and so it stays at roughly the same temperature for quite some while and then it melts and only when it's all molten then when you put in more energy then the liquid starts raising in rising in temperature. So why is that good then? That sounds like an inefficiency. Well, yes, it's an inefficiency to, to heat it up and get it molten in the first place, but it's an efficiency when you think that this is about storing energy because it works both ways. So once you've got it molten, then it'll cool down to almost but not quite a freezing temperature, solidifying temperature, temperature for fusion, uh, and then it'll stay there for quite some while because it has to cool down an awful lot, uh, well, um, 390,000 joules per kilo uh, before it'll start to solidify. So it's actually a very good way of storing energy long term. Uh, so what you do is you melt your aluminium during the day and then during the night, on demand, someone in Abu Dhabi decides he wants to play computer games, um, uh, he switches on his computer and uh, the grid somehow senses this demand and sends word to this uh, setup and some of the heat is moved from you know, the molten aluminium to the Stirling engine, drives the Stirling engine which then generates the electricity so that that person in Abu Dhabi can play his computer game. I'm not entirely certain how the heat is transferred from one box to the other. Um, I suspect they don't pump molten aluminium across to the Stirling engine. I suspect they probably pump very hot water that's heated by the molten aluminium. But anyway, somehow they get the heat from the molten aluminium to the Stirling engine, electricity through the night. And this is apparently quite a successful system. Uh, it, it's being trialed at the moment. It's not, it's not, uh, not mainstream by any uh, by means yet, but the company itself, in its uh, uh, press releases and, and conference uh, publicity, and therefore you should take these figures perhaps with a little uh, bit of scepticism, uh, claims that it can produce one uh, megawatt hour uh, for just 93 euros, whereas to put that into perspective, it's about 225 euros for diesel and about 135 for uh, storing, uh, taking uh, electricity out of, of storage in battery form. There are other problems with battery. I mean, admittedly, batteries are coming on in leaps and bounds. For the last 20 years, batteries have got way better than they used to be, but they are possibly approaching their limits. Um, and if you want to charge up a battery uh, over a six hour period and then discharge it, unevenly over the next 18 and then repeat that over and over. It's not actually the most efficient way to use a battery uh, nor the, the, the gra greatest way to get the most battery life and batteries are still expensive so there are problems with batteries. So one partial solution might be this sort of system. Uh, when they tried it in uh, California they claim they got um, the energy 53% cheaper and 83% whatever that means cleaner. You see, Stirling engines, as I mentioned in my earlier video, have no emissions. They don't give off any exhaust fumes themselves um, and they're quiet so they're sort of clean. Now, um, uh, 
Uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, the pandemic has, has somewhat distorted my uh, appreciation of time, but yeah, it was a couple of years ago, I was invited up to Glasgow University to give a speech, and while I was up there, I went to the Hunterian Museum, which I would definitely recommend, by the way, if you find yourself in Glasgow, uh, anywhere near the university, get yourself to the Hunterian Museum. Uh, it's got loads of really good exhibitions and one entire wing devoted to science. And they have a lot of the original measuring devices built by famous people you've heard of, like Marconi and, and Kelvin, and of course, Robert Stirling, the inventor of the Stirling engine. And they've got one of Robert Stirling's own Stirling engines. Now, how many Stirling engines do you think Robin, sorry, Robert, possibly with the help of his brother James, built? The answer is two, and they've got the Mark II. It seems that uh, he, he built them, uh, by, the, uh, by the way, he built, he built the Mark II in 1816. That's just one year after the Battle of Waterloo, which is pretty mind-boggling. Anyway, uh, it seems that uh, he built it. Uh, there you go, I've demonstrated the science. It works, demonstration of principle. I think job done, really. I'll leave it to other people to develop. Anyway, this is what it looks like. Yes, of course, it would have turned mahogany supports because they had standards in those days. And here it is, in all its marvellous simplicity. I think you'll agree that it looks a lot like the engine I showed you in my first video. Kelvin, yes, that Kelvin, Mr. Absolute Zero, found it abandoned in a cluttered room in 1847 and started using it as a teaching aid. Now, for those of you struggling to match it to the engine that I used as a teaching aid, see that the cranks and flywheel are the same, while this column here is the equivalent of this much squatter column, and is where the displacer goes up and down. This piston housing is the equivalent of this piston housing, but whereas the displacer column and piston housing are one on top of the other on the left, on Stirling's Stirling engine, there is a little connecting air pipe that you might have missed. The bottom plates of both machines could be heated. In the case of Stirling's, this was perhaps simply with a candle. Adding to the sophistication, the equivalent of the cooler upper plate on the modern demonstration engine is the upper half of the displacer column, which is housed in a water jacket, which is filled from below by one pipe and drained at the top by another. You can see that this flywheel has a deep groove in it for holding a drive belt so that it could do practical work such as oscillating a punch bowl. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the engine that didn't quite end up powering the Industrial Revolution, as it turned out, but which is today found in some orbiting satellites. Oh, you're still watching. Oh, that's a good sign, because if you've watched this far into a video on the admittedly rather obscure topic of Stirling engines, then you're also probably the sort of fellow who's interested in, oh, you know, science and knowledge and, and truth and engineering and, and these sort of things, in which case you're my kind of viewer. And what's more, you're also the sort of person who's likely to benefit from the services of my sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. So if you were to go to, say, thegreatcoursesplus.com, stroke Lindy Beige, notice I didn't say www dot there because I don't have to anymore, because progress. So that's thegreatcoursesplus.com, stroke Lindy Beige, or you could just click the link in the description. Then you could take advantage of the trial period. You could go around the enormous site, have a look at all the uh, thousands of lectures they've got by distinguished university professors from around the world and just, well, take your pick, watch what you want. And one of the courses is called Understanding the, Inven the Inventions That Changed the World. And I think that's definitely pertinent to the subject matter of this video. Um, and uh, it goes through the ages, it deals with, uh, well, obviously, the engines, obviously, I mean, you're bound to have engines in there, but there's other stuff like the potter's wheel and distillation, which is perhaps more significant than you realise. And uh, there's crossbows and gunpowder, for those of you of a more military bent, and uh, there's paper and lenses and uh, all sorts of things right the way up to the internet. Anyway, um, I know what some of you may be fearing though. The scholar that we see lecturing us, you know, how are his cradles? And, you know, is, are his gestures really that good? Well, um, I have to admit that they're not utterly top notch. Let's, let's have a look. He, he opens with a, a fairly relaxed uh, front interlace there, uh, but after that it's, it's largely uh, asymmetric, uh, one-handed stuff. Um, it's, it, I wouldn't really use him as a model. Uh, occasionally you see him do some fairly basic uh, parallel waving, but no, I would say that if uh, brushing up on your scholar's cradles is your top priority, possibly you should pick another course. But uh, this one 
is definitely about uh, science and engineering and, and knowledge, so it, it's all good. And there's a 273-page uh, free-to-download PDF guidebook that goes with the course. So that's one of the many courses that you could pick from uh, on the my sponsor's uh, website, The Great Courses Plus. <laughs> now, another thing which I said in my previous video on Stirling engines, which I think you really ought to see because it's terribly good, uh, was that an application of a Stirling engine might be to generate electricity from the waste heat that comes out of server centres, data centres, which they build in very cold places like Finland. So you've got a room, massive room, filled with loads and loads of computer arrays, the servers, which are serving the internet and the cloud and all that sort of stuff and generating a lot of heat and uh, that heat has to go somewhere and that's why they build them in very cold places because they're trying to control the heat generated the waste product which is this heat of all these uh, of all these servers and then you could just cover the building in Stirling engines which would be hot on one side because of the heat from the data center and cold on the other because Finland uh, and then they'd be going like Bilio! People used to say it goes like Bilio when I was a little kid. They don't say that anymore. But anyway, they'd be going like Bilio, generating loads of electricity, which you could then uh, use to run the data center. I mean, obviously not, not you know, it wouldn't be 100% efficient, but, but you could you know, save the data center some money uh, on electrical costs. So I thought, what a brilliant idea I'd had. But uh, one of my viewers, uh, going by the name of Eugene, wrote in to me uh, saying that he used to work in uh, a server center and no, that idea is not no, is not good. Uh, there are problems with it. Um, it's the trouble. Reality always gets in the way. It turns out that real life is always a bit more complicated than that. Well, yes, I suspected it would be. But anyway, uh, he said, for instance, that uh, what you're trying to do is, is lose heat uh, to Finland uh, through the walls um, and that the Stirling engines themselves are trying to retain heat because they want, in order to run better, they want the, the plate that's on the inside of the building to be heating up and to stay hot. So the actual engine is insulation on the building. Uh, and of course, if you use the electricity from the Stirling engine to run a, a cooling system, it'll never be 100% efficient. So that's not gonna work either. Um, and I, and I, oh, okay, right, so uh, I immediately I, I wrote back to him with an alternative design. All right, so let's have a very badly insulated building at the, at the bottom with the server center losing heat to Finland, uh, but hot air rises so we could have uh, the ceiling which is a great big funnel which leads to a shaft to uh, another room somewhere else perhaps above and that room is insulated and that room gets hot and that room is covered in sterling engines and, and there you go he said and and, uh, and 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 i thought what if if the whole system does overheat uh, you could have some flaps, perhaps, uh, all uh, lining the, uh, the the tunnel that goes up to the top room and, and some sort of uh, door that could close that room off. All these flaps could open and just dump all the hot air into Finland. Finland gets a bit warmer. The Finns will be happy with that. Uh, and, and that'll be great. And, and he wrote back and said, no, no, they really, really wouldn't want to do that. You see, in a data center, the air uh, has to uh, be of constant humidity and be very, very clean. And yes, of course, you could chill it and you could dehumidify it and you could clean it, but all of that is expensive. They'd much rather have the same clean air at constant humidity going round and round and round and, and, and never uh, dump it into the environment. Uh, okay, so that idea didn't quite work out, but I feel that there's still some middle line. What about the exhaust? So you've got all this um, uh, machinery for circulating the air because, of course, the data center doesn't generate heat completely evenly. There, there are certain hot spots in each machine and you've got to blow air over those hot spots. And so you've got these eddies and currents and, and you've got to have fans and you've got to have power. So there's a system for doing that and it'll, it'll get hot. And so it'll have to have an exhaust somewhere. And that would be presumably outside the building for losing heat. You could that, then when you cover the exhaust, put, put them on the exhaust, loads of Stirling engines. And he said, no, no, because the exhaust is meant to be losing heat to the environment. If you cover it in Stirling engines, they'll act as insulation again and stop it cooling down uh, uh, well, well could you just have the exhaust bigger and just have a few sterling engines on it i mean you know let's just try it uh, well there you go reality always gets in the way of a good idea but I, I think there's probably some potential in there somewhere perhaps um anyway uh but, but reality can be quite good um and one part of my reality is that people do occasionally send me uh, nice stuff for free and um, a company that uh, produces all sorts of model kit engines of various sorts, including uh, Stirling engines, 
Someone from that company in China saw my previous video, the one I keep going on about, about Stirling engines, and uh, oh, said, we must send this guy some stuff. So they sent me some stuff. They sent me this uh, kit of a Stirling engine. Um, so the company is called uh, Engine DIY, and my, they haven't paid me any money to say anything in particular. They've just sent me some free stuff out of the blue. Um, my sole um, interaction with this company is just having been sent some free stuff by it. So I, I, I have no idea what it's like to deal with as a customer, but I can say that looking at the website, they've got a huge number of uh, engines, really quite a, a surprising and impressive array of options. Anyway, what I thought I'd do is I'd finally get to use the uh, time-lapse feature on my camera and put this together. Now, some people might be disappointed to find that the thing they ordered arrives in bits, but I like putting things together. I had some tools standing by, but in the end, I needed only my deft fingers and the Allen keys that came with it. It has little sticky padded feet that hold it steady on the table. The English on the instructions was of the usual entertaining type found in Chinese literature of this sort. The parts were precisely made and fitted fine with a bit of effort. Don't put one of these together over a sewerage grate, though, because there are some very small parts and most things you only get one of. If you don't have a cable-knit woolly jumper, I suppose you could wear something else, but why risk it? Um. Right, well, I, I seem to have finished it. According to my cooker timer, it uh, took 38 minutes, uh, although that did include uh, time faffing around with the camera and uh, answering the door for a delivery. So about half an hour, I would say. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't rushing it, and uh, I certainly wasn't uh, trying to uh, present it to the camera, so sorry if my hands got in the way a bit. Uh, right, now according to the destructions, I should use 95% medical alcohol. I don't have any of that, but I do have some 99%, so I'll give that a go. Right, here we go then. Moment of truth. The instructions say to give it uh, half a minute or so to heat up. things that uh, Stirling engines are particularly famous for is how quiet they are. Almost silent, according to the label of, of the Mark II in the Hunterian Museum. Um, this one seems to be generating quite a bit of noise, all of, almost all of which is coming from this bit of the apparatus, not here. So the pistons are going in and out uh, quietly enough, but uh, something is, is rattling with the flywheels. Um, but um, maybe a drop of oil would solve that. Anyway, it's going like, like Billio. Remember how things used to go like Billio? Well, it's going like that. So, um, thanks, Robert. I do notice that the light that is powered by this uh, contraption is dimmer than the flame which is providing the heat that powers it. Oh. What happened there? <laughs> 